Department of Foreign Language Studies to participate in PC Centennial Celebration. I'm Monica Simal, Assistant Professor of Spanish, and I would like to thank my colleagues here uh, who are participating in this panel, and I will introduce them to you during this hour. But now I would like to start with the elephant in the room. If English is the lingua franca of international relations in the 21st century, why do Americans even need to learn a foreign language? Yes, English. English is the accepted lingua franca of international business, and US students may therefore feel another language is unnecessary. In fact, only 18% of Americans report speaking a language other than English while 53% of Europeans and an increasing numbers in other parts of the world can converse in a second language. Perhaps if their only competitors in the global job market were other monolingual Americans, there will be no cause for concern. But the global job market will include a very crowded field of well-educated graduates from Europe, China, Mexico, and many other countries who have mastered English on top of their mother tongue. The reality of the 21st century job market is that Americans will be competing for a job where, with other skills being equal, they will be compared to a multilingual and culturally competent candidate. According to the former US Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, to prosper economically and to improve relations with other countries, Americans need to read, speak, and understand other languages. And this is what we want to talk about today, the multiple advantages of learning a foreign language. Beyond me being more competitive in the global job market, individuals who have language abilities can provide one's own community or company with an inside view of foreign cultures and give insights into other perspectives on international situations and current events. For survival, in the global community, every nation needs such individuals. Students at Providence College are just these types of individuals, steeped in the Dominican mission of social justice and mutual respect. The Department of Foreign Language Studies agrees with Nelson Mandela when he said, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him, in his own language that goes to his heart. Now, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Rino Capaletti, Associate Professor of Italian, who will give us a brief history of the Foreign Language Studies Department at Providence College. Grazie, Monica, and buongiorno. Good morning to all of you, and thank you for attending this session. The Department of Foreign Language Studies rejoices in commemorating the centennial of Providence College, by the way, my alma mater as well. Founded in 1917 as an all-male school, PC began with only one building, Parkins Hall, nine Dominican faculty members, 71 students, and it has grown to approximately 4,600 students, undergraduate and postgraduate, over 300 fa lay faculty, about 30 Dominican friars and sisters, 50 buildings, and as you notice, expanding. In 1933, when the college received regional accreditation, Two-year study of a foreign language, Latin included, was part of the general degree requirements. During World War II, the, war, the U.S. War Department established at PC an Army Specialized Training uh, Program Unit. About 400 cadets studied at Providence College before going abroad. After the war, the college introduced the uh, Reserve Officers Program uh, called the so-called ROTC, which continues to this day. 
Due to strategic and security reasons, French, German, Italian, Spanish uh, classes had strong enrollment in the years prior to and after World War II. During the Cold War period, the department offered also a minor in Russian and Portuguese, respectively. In those years, languages were considered essential in the enrichment of students' knowledge of their society and the world, broadening their social appreciation and promoting international understanding. Reflecting the changing times, in 1968, the school abolished the dress code. And in the 1971-72 academic year, uh, women were first admitted. Since their admission, the majority of students enrolled in foreign language classes have been women. Perhaps due to the male to female ratio of about 44% to 56%, women also constitute the majority of the increasing number of students participating in special programs abroad. Adrian will correct me if I'm wrong on this. Uh, obviously, the, stu uh, the study of foreign languages uh, currently is not a core requirement. Students in general uh, understand the importance of acquiring cross-cultural knowledge. Also, in 1971, the college eliminated the foreign language requirement to institute the development of Western Civilization Program, so-called BWC, making it the main component of the core curriculum. Originally, BWC required 20 credits to be fulfilled in the freshman and sophomore years. Recently, it has been reduced to 16 credits. Consequently, enrollment in foreign languages dwindled and Russian and Portuguese offerings were eliminated. Nonetheless, many students seem enthusiastic about continuing or initiating their immersion in foreign language, understanding its importance. Nowadays, in light of the recent inclusion of foreign language courses as an option for fulfilling certain core requirements and proficiencies, such as core focus, intensive writing, oral communication, diversity, and also in light of the expansion of our offerings um, with courses in Arabic and Chinese, the department is attracting more students into its programs. Thank you. Thank you, Reno. I would like to uh, introduce you to Dr. Alison Kaplan, Chair of the Department of Foreign Language Studies. She's going to talk today how the teaching of foreign language at PC has adapted to the times. Good morning, everybody. Um, there have been a number of changes. <laughs> uh, in the past century, there have been a number of changes in focus and priority in the way that we teach foreign language. In the early 20th century, the language teaching method was known as the grammar translation method. And the focus was on the structure of the language, um, syntax and, and grammar, and on written texts. Then in about the 1970s, 1980s, uh, the communicative approach came into vogue, and the emphasis was then on uh, oral proficiency, on how to hold a conversation. And so in our classes, we spoke only in the target language with uh, what, what's called authentic materials, uh, using uh, journals or using uh, newspaper articles or video clips. Now, in addition to building uh, on the student's grammar, on the student's linguistic 
accuracy and his or her communicative competence, we emphasize critical thinking skills. So the approach is not only to teach grammar and to hold conversations entirely in the target language uh, and to use language as a tool to reflect on what we are doing and thinking, but also to encourage students to reflect on language itself, on language as a social construct whose meaning varies widely depending on who is talking to whom, in what situation and medium, and from within what historical period or what cultural milieu. And so here we have an image of your brain on language. Uh, <laughs> the versatility, the adaptability of your brain. And there is, have been a number of recent studies, and this one's from the University of Chicago, 2012, uh, suggesting that foreign language study, the bilingual brain, uh, helps you to reduce biases in your decision making, and even, they're suggesting, uh, will pre prevent or uh, slow down the onset of dementia or other related uh, uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's. So I want to give you an idea of what we are doing in our classrooms here at Providence College. Uh, from the earliest years of study, from uh, you know, in the in the intermediate, the, the elementary and intermediate language students, uh, language courses, students are exposed to uh, always consistently to broader sociolinguistic and cultural qu questions through textbooks we've chosen and activities that we've developed that interrogate, interrogate language usage in terms of regional, class, gender, and faith differences. So reflecting always on language as a social construct. Through a variety of art, film, literature, music, students in our classes are able to engage and adapt to different registers and perspectives within a second language. And that allows them to reflect on their own native language as well and how it's used. Uh, here, this is an example just from an intermediate class. Uh, this, there's a clip shown um, uh, on the topic of uh, immigration, the hijab, the wearing of the veil, and then integrated into that are grammar exercises and vocabulary exercises. Another example uh, here on the uh, infamous wall that exists and that uh, one of the candidates proposes to uh, uh, extend. Uh, and this also is a song that's played, uh, vocabulary is filled in, and there's a discussion about um, <coughs> the whole issue of um, illegal immigration and immigration. Uh, in our more advanced courses, uh, we have been working uh, on building faculty-student research collaborations uh, that allow our majors to do in-depth scholarship and be mentored by uh, a faculty member in our, in our department. And this is one example of Dr. Monica Simal and uh, one of our majors, Regan Whipple, last year, who went to a conference uh, and presented on uh, a paper that she wrote in an independent study um, with Dr. Simal. Uh, another project that uh, uh, I'm very pleased to be working on with a colleague, Dr. Nuria Alonso Garcia, is uh, our Golden Age Literature Glossary Online. This is a social semiotic approach to reading classic uh, Spanish literature texts. And this is uh, a project that the students, all of those students, uh, presented at the celebration of student scholarship last year. And then their analysis was, has been integrated into our database, um, which is called Galgo. And, uh, Students over the years in our 400 level courses have been doing this kind of social semiotic research and we have been integrating it into this database that will be uh, for use in, 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 our, in classes in the future. One of our um, 
uh, greatest uh, changes has been the integration of non-Western languages, the inclusion of non-Western languages in our department, um, namely Arabic and Chinese. And that is, is a result of greater student interest in learning about cultures um, unlike our own. And so we've added uh, Chinese and Arabic. And I wanted to end just with a short clip of a skit done by students in an intermediate Arabic course, just to show you the comfort level of these students after only one year of studying Arabic. <laughs> Tough on Donald. Um, well, in our skit, Jake and Kim are Jordanian, and the greetings in different Arabic countries um, vary country to country. So, since they're from Jordan, they exchanged one kiss on each cheek because they know each other well. They're friends. Kaifa Haluka. Jaya. Don't keep a kind of hafa. Um, Ra'ya Muntaza, um, attack it, um, on Alugania Ferus, and the Hasout Ramila. Who him Ferus? Uh, Subani, uh, Habaitak. Be safe. Habaitak. Be shitty. Uh, Ferus is, uh, one of the most famous. But it's an example of how the students interact with now produce a target language, in this case, Arabic. Um, so now it's a pleasure for me to introduce you to um, one of my uh, colleagues. Um, she has a, um, an interesting story because she was a former uh, student here at PC, and she used to be one of our colleagues as well. She's now uh, working at the University of Rhode Island, and it's Dr. Kara Gazzara Hanson. And she graduated with a BA in Italian at Providence College and earned her PhD in Italian at the University of Chicago. Her dissertation, which concentrated on literary works of St. Catherine of, St. Catherine of Siena, investigated the Dominican tertiary role as a doctrinal model for Italian women's mystics. So it's a please. I'm pleased to introduce you, Dr. Carol Gasana. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming today. Um, I'd like to thank the Department of Foreign Language Studies for the gracious invitation and also the warm welcome back to Providence <coughs> College. It is both an honor and a privilege to return to my alma mater, not only during the college's centennial convocation, but also in commemoration of my 20th anniversary as an alumna. Just dated myself, so, <laughs> so the opportunity to speak here today holds special meaning as both a professional and a personal milestone. The experiences I discuss today will be different from those of my colleagues and the other panelists, as I will be speaking from multiple perspectives. First as a student, then as a scholar and a professor. What I hope to highlight for you is how a liberal arts education, and one inspired by the Dominican tradition, enabled me to approach future experiences with cultural awareness and global competence. I firmly believe that my training at Providence College through the general curriculum, but more importantly, through the study of foreign languages, taught me to think critically and analytically. As a result, I hope to demonstrate how I was able to dovetail scholarship and spirituality. I began my studies at Providence College in 1992, and shortly thereafter declared Italian as my major. In doing so, I began to explore not only the linguistic aspects of foreign language study, but also its literature and its cultural richness. At the time, I was not fully cognizant of the effects my liberal arts education and language studies would have on my scholarly pursuits. However, it wasn't long before my Dominican training would manifest itself, namely when I began my master's work at The Ohio State University in 1996. With this endeavor, not only did I broaden my knowledge and exposure to the Italian language, culture, and literature that I had first glimpsed at Providence College, but I also received my first education or instruction on how to teach foreign languages. I slowly began the transition from student to teacher, a process that would continue throughout my graduate studies. The language skills I had obtained at Providence College now took on a deeper pedagogical purpose. 
I realized that teaching a foreign language would enmesh my professional and personal goals seamlessly. Having studied at Providence College, I witnessed firsthand how the order of preachers exercise a didactic vocation in their daily practice. Therefore, the concept of teaching was implicit to my understanding of how we, as Catholics, perpetuate and disseminate knowledge. Teaching was an organic progression for me, and my call to preach, my evangelical voice, revealed itself through language learning, instruction, and ethnic consciousness. Shortly after this, this professional epiphany, I decided to pursue my doctorate. I began my doctoral work at the University of Chicago, and my Dominican Catholic faith made its most profound mark. St. Catherine of Siena, female mystic, Dominican tertiary, and church doctor, became my muse. Throughout my years of doctoral work, Catherine, along with several other female Dominican mystic women, became the topic of my dissertation. Though I first met Catherine while a student at Providence College, little did I know that she would return many years later and inspire my scholarly work. Catherine's opus is filled with mystical and doctrinal insight. She tackles thorny concepts such as faith, virtue, reason, prayer, obedience, and the incarnation, just to name a few. The vastness of my Catholic education through the study of those such as Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, and St. Bonaventure gave me a solid foundation for my academic research. Further, the critical thinking and linguistic skills that I had gained as an undergraduate language major allowed me to confront spiritual concepts with knowledge not only of their religious weight, but their comprehensive impact on Italian literature and culture. I advanced my foreign language competence and linguistic proficiency with the higher aim of placing literary works in their appropriate cultural and historical contexts. In doing so, I could examine these works with a critical, historical, yet objective eye. My Dominican preparation enabled me to speak intelligently, confidently, and capably about spiritual matters since I was well-versed in Christian philosophy. I could analyze complex concepts of church doctrine with relative ease since I had previous exposure and familiarity within the spiritual framework of a Dominican Catholic education. Though I would never describe the dissertation writing process as an easy one, my training at Providence College certainly gave me the tools I needed to complete the task which I did 10 years after graduating from Providence College. Though I traveled quite a bit as a result of my graduate studies, including a six-month stay in Pisa while writing my thesis, Providence College was never far away. After completing my doctoral degree, I returned to Rhode Island and the institution where my career began. However, this time, it was no longer as a student, but as a professor, teaching language courses for the department, serving briefly as a departmental liaison speaking with incoming students about foreign language opportunities, attending the major minor fair, and encouraging the study of foreign languages both on the Providence College campus and abroad. My Providence College experience had come full circle, and I immediately felt a sense of belonging and purpose through my work here. It was a unique chance for me to give back to a program that had given me so much. If I could inspire just one student, though I hoped there would be many more, then I had fulfilled my purpose. Today I still teach, and the courses I instruct run the gamut from basic Italian language to conversation and composition to literature and culture. And each teaching experience offers an irreplaceable opportunity for me to underscore the importance of foreign languages beyond their linguistic component. Learning foreign languages is so much more than attaining linguistic proficiency. Languages are a gateway to many other disciplines, including but not limited to history, gender studies, sociology, art, business, and religion. A student with second language capabilities possesses a skill that can complement any program of study, and I aim to highlight this advantage in every course I teach. I could never have imagined how a Dominican education in language studies would have propelled my career in the way it did, nor could I have anticipated the opportunities it would have afforded me. My career path has not always been linear, Yet my education prepared me well for the challenges I have faced and continue to face in a global society with constantly changing goals and objectives. The cognitive openness and flexibility that language studies provide can enhance any discipline. But I stress that language adeptness cannot be substituted or replaced. A Catholic liberal arts education, which includes a language component, teaches students how to live not only as knowledgeable citizens, but also as informed Catholics, ready to respond to the questions of the times with acceptance, tolerance, open-mindedness, and a progressive spirit. 
I think we can all agree that this is an admirable goal. And if learn, learning foreign languages fosters this mission, then we are bound to continue to encourage its conclusion at Providence College and beyond. Thank you so much, Gera, for sharing your wonderful experience here as a former student uh, and a colleague at, at Providence College. And now I would like to introduce um, our current student, Taylor Gibson, who is a senior. Um, she's a political science and a Spanish double major with a minor in Latin American studies. Please uh, help me to welcome Taylor Gibson. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Um, last night, I had a lot of friends promising that at 8.30 in the morning, they were going to be sitting in front row, um, and noticeably absent, so I really do appreciate all of you being here this morning. Um, and it's kind of nice that I'm coming into this conversation after having so many of my esteemed peers talk about the importance of foreign language, because usually I have to start with that, and I couldn't have done it as eloquently as they had. So um, I just appreciate that I'm coming into a conversation and talking about my experiences of using my second language capabilities after with a fundamental understanding with everyone in the room that foreign language acquisition is so, so important. Um, and I'm so glad that Father Arik is actually in the room because um, I want to talk about my first time actually ever leaving the United States um, when I went to Argentina, Tucumán, Argentina, um, as a gift from the college on my Father Smith Fellowship. Um, last summer, I stepped off the plane by myself um, in Buenos Aires and then made a connecting flight to Tucumán. And it was the first time that I had ever left the United States. Um, and I was a recipient, as I said, of the Father Smith Fellowship. Um, I walked into the room, and um, the first question for the Spanish speakers in the room was asked to me in the vosotros form. And I kind of looked around, and um, it was a moment where I stepped back, and, and all of my training that I had had in high school and college kicked in. And I said to myself, wow, up to this point, I have had the most incredible professors and instructors who helped me with the fundamentals of learning the language in terms of writing and reading. And this was the first time that, in practice, I had to actually utilize my foreign language in conversation. Um, and the, the things that I learned from that experience and the cultural takeaways um, just can't really be put into words. Um, and so that was my, my first experience ever, and it was a gift from the college um, using my, my foreign language capabilities. Shortly after that, I had the opportunity to um, serve as a leader at, on the global service learning trip to Tijuana, Mexico. Um, that trip is called Global Border Crossings. And what we do there is we fly to San Diego and cross the border on foot um, and enter into Tijuana and work with an organization called Esperanza International. And that experience was so important to me because it was the first time that I ever served as a translator for a large group of people. And it was the first time that I was able to see with my own eyes the value of being able to understand someone in their target language and, and hearing that conversation for yourself and being able to understand it and then having to translate it to a large group of people and seeing the, the, the value and the importance of really hearing someone in their native tongue and being able to understand the emotion and um, all the, all the cultural aspects behind that. Um, so that was my second experience utilizing my foreign language experience here at Providence College. Um, the third most recent um, trip that I had abroad was actually to Nicaragua with Dr. Nuria Alonso Garcia. Um, and we most recently went last week actually um, to Nicaragua uh, through the Global Service Learning Program in a program called Storytellers in Our Communities. And what we did there was work with high school students. Um, they were they're graduating seniors. And we worked on pillars of uh, public speaking and um, we're actually working on producing a TED Talk with them um, this fall. And that was another incredible experience. Um, what I did this summer was actually imperative to my foreign language skills. Um, it required me to be bilingual in both Spanish and English. I served as an immigration and citizenship caseworker aide at Dorcas International here in Providence. And many people at PSP has actually um, served there as their service site. Um, but what was unique about my position that some Providence College students are not able to fulfill is that you had to be bilingual. And so working in that department and utilizing my foreign language skills in both translation and working with clients um, was an experience that I'll carry with me forever. 
Um, currently, I am in the process of studying for the LSAT and will be applying to law school with a future career goal of being an immigration attorney, um, which is a career path that my foreign language skills will be imperative and that I will utilize every single day. Um, and so I think it's just wonderful that we're able to see um, an example in a Providence College student who um, three times now has, through the college, been able to travel abroad, utilize my foreign language skills, and, and without my foreign language skills, those opportunities never would have been possible for me, nor would my internship have been possible for me, um, and my future career path has been greatly impacted by my foreign language capabilities. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I appreciate it. You can tell that it's a pleasure to have Taylor in one of our classes. She's a tremendous student. Um, so now I would like to introduce to my colleague Patricia Lollor, professor of Spanish, oh, sorry, from French, <laughs> professor of French, talking about Spanish before, the, and she's going to talk about the power of language and business. So welcome, Professor Lollor. Good morning. Bonjour. Um, Yes, I'm going to um, build on what my colleagues have already spoken to, and that is the evolution of the study and teaching of foreign languages at Providence College through the example of the powerful partnership of foreign languages and business. I think we have, yeah. Um, and this is particularly interesting because traditionally these have been seen as two almost polar opposite disciplines in terms of their perceived practicality. But with the evolution of language teaching and with the changing world that we live in, these two disciplines have proven to be more and more complementary. Um, PC is at the forefront of this partnership of foreign language study and business. As many of you probably know, a significant number of our students come in as declared business majors. And this is a very particular population because these business majors choose to come to a liberal arts college rather than to go to a business school. So they are already aware of the importance of balancing their business studies with liberal arts. More and more of these students come in also with an awareness of the importance of foreign language study, understanding that foreign languages are one of the foundational disciplines of the liberal arts. So we have the, the opportunity to foster this development and partnership among our students. They are aware that competency at an advanced level in a foreign language empowers them to understand how other people think, how other people see the world, how other people understand and interpret. And these are all very valuable tools in the business world because it en enables them to anticipate, to present, and to market in the most effective terms possible and to become very powerful partners and competitors in the global marketplace. Especially when we understand that since English is spoken everywhere, we don't necessarily need to know another language to communicate our ideas, but it is a distinct advantage to know how people in other cultures think and perceive what we're doing, especially when they know that about us. So our students come in already with this awareness. So I want to build on this by giving you the example of one particular uh, case, a student who just graduated in May. Her name is Sarah, and she was a marketing French major. She came in declared as a marketing major. But she had had a very good experience studying foreign languages in high school. She liked French very much, and she wanted to continue the study of French at Providence College. And she was having a difficult time fitting French into her schedule freshman year because her major plan of study had already been mapped out. But she was very persistent. She really wanted to do this. So we worked very hard together, and we managed to fit French into her program freshman year which allowed her to keep so many options open as opposed to leaving the study of French to later on junior year when certain opportunities would have been closed. So she took French her freshman year, she continued with it, decided that she would minor in it, and as she continued, she decided to double major in marketing in French, which was extremely challenging because there are significant requirements in both. She was also able to study abroad. She spent one semester in Paris, and she chose a program that was perfectly suited to her interests and her needs. She chose a program called International uh, Francophone Studies. 
She spent a semester in Paris where the first part of the semester was spent in rigorous classroom work. She earned her academic credits in French. The second half of the semester was spent in an internship. This program matches students with internships that are suited to their particular interests and plan of study. And Sarah was placed in a boutique travel firm in the marketing division. So she worked there for half of the semester, and one component of this program was that she also did a significant research project and produced a 50-page thesis in French at the conclusion of her internship. The internship afforded her the opportunity to interact with young professionals, people just a little bit older than her, with more seasoned professionals, and to see the culture through the perspective, through the lens of the workplace environment that she expected to work in when she returned to the United States. It was an invaluable experience, and she was thrilled to be able to do so. When she came back uh, to Providence College, perfectly fluent. She thought, when I first talked to her on the phone, I thought it was a French girl I was speaking to. She, uh, of course, every study abroad program builds immense confidence is one of the purposes, but this was a particular experience because it was so suited to two normally diverse interests of academic study. During her senior year, one of her requirements in marketing was a capstone course, and she was able to do her capstone course uh, with, it was a collaborative project uh, at in the marketing division at the French American School in Providence. So she had two workplace-related experience that totally depended upon her competency in France and her understanding of the language and the culture from within. When she came home, she was so enthusiastic about this possibility and so uh, convinced of the importance of partnering language study with business for those students who have an interest in language that she gave a presentation to the college before she graduated. And she made a few key points in her presentation. This is her takeaway. This was a conclusion. And when she says, be curious, she wanted to encourage students to pursue their interests uh, beyond what is required, to not feel constrained by requirements and restrictions, but to pursue what really speaks to them and to be persistent. And it really did pay off for her. Um, to challenge yourself, move out of your comfort zone, do more than you're required to do, try something new, go farther, be more advanced than you need to be. Take risks. It is risky to go abroad when you have, feel that you have minimum confidence, uh, competency, but when you're there, you realize that your confidence builds because you know a lot more than you think you do. And I think that, that Taylor spoke very eloquently to that, and so did that, Kara. Once you're in the position and you speak, you have renewed confidence. So take risks, and don't be afraid to do anything, and uh, be confident that you can blend, partner two disciplines that have significant requirements that are very demanding, but where there's a will, there's a way. I think every language has a cliche for that expression. <laughs> and uh, in Sarah's case, it did pay off. She was very persistent, but it has to begin freshman year, and she encourages all of us to work together to make this possible for students who have these two interests that have traditionally been seen as separate, but that are very complementary and powerful today. So we all thank Sarah for her input on this, this project. Thank you so much to Patricia, our French professor, and now I would like to introduce to Dr. Marginot, professor of Spanish, who is going to talk today about the high number of PC Fulbright scholarship recipients. So welcome. Buenos días a todos. Buenos días. Me comprenden perfectamente, ¿no? <laughs> perfectamente, ¿no? Muy bien, estupendo. That was a brief encounter with the other, which is what the Fulbright program is all about. The Fulbright program is the flagship international educational exchange program sponsored by the U.S. government and is designed to increase mutual understanding between the people of the United States and the people of other countries. The Fulbright U.S. student program is the largest U.S. exchange program offering opportunities for students and young professionals to undertake international graduate study, advanced research, university teaching, and primary and secondary school teaching worldwide. A little bit of history. 
very brief. In 1945, Senator William J. William Fulbright introduced a bill in the United States Congress that called for the use of surplus war property to fund, quote, the promotion of international goodwill through the exchange of students in the fields of education, culture, <clears throat> and science, end quote. Thus, the Fulbright Scholarship Program was born. Since 1946, when the bill was signed into legislation by President Truman, more than 360,000 Fulbrighters from the United States and other countries have participated in the program. I'd like to speak with you briefly about uh, a few of our most recent Fulbrighters here at Providence College. Our first uh, recipient, or the first person I'd like to speak about, is Emma Wright. Emma was senior class president here at Providence College. She majored in history and minored in French and German. I believe she studied abroad in Germany. She received an English teaching assistantship to teach in Erlangen, Germany, and work on sustainable food policy while she was there. Emma recently completed her law degree at Boston University and is preparing for the bar exam. Our next recipient is Tylea Richard. Tylea majored in public and community service and minored in Spanish. She received a Fulbright Research Scholarship to study the quality of life for garment workers in the Dominican Republic. And she is currently in the process of launching her own clothing company in California. Our next recipient is a faculty member here at the college. <laughs> And I believe she's in the room over there. Dr. Nuria Alonso Garcia, the director of the Global Studies program here at the college, received a Fulbright U.S. Scholar Grant to teach English in St. Petersburg, Russia. The title of her project highlights the principal goal of the Fulbright program, erase barriers between people from different cultures. Our next recipient, is Emily Kennedy, who double majored in Spanish and Global Studies. Emily's firm belief that access to clean water is a human right yielded a Fulbright Research Scholarship to study the relationship between political activism and the availability of potable water in the city of Claypole, Claypole Argentina. Perhaps Taylor has visited Claypole, I'm not sure. Todavía no, algún día, huh? Uh, our next recipient is Kelly Garland. She was senior class president of 2016. Kelly majored in global studies. She minored in French and sociology. She's currently an English teaching assistant in the Czech Republic. Vincent Whalen. Vince was also a Fulbright uh, teaching assistant last year in Spain. He majored in Spanish and economics, and he taught in Madrid. And I thought it would be interesting to listen what Vince has to say about the Fulbright program. Hi, my name is Vince Whalen. I'm a 2015 graduate of PC, and last year I was a Fulbright English teaching assistant in Spain. Um, for me, winning a Fulbright meant the opportunity to see the world as somebody else sees it. So I was placed in an international university with campuses in Madrid and Segovia, and I work mostly with first-year students and faculty and staff in tutoring programs and conversation workshops. And through those classes, I really got a sense of how language and culture interact on a daily basis and how people are able to apply those things in their everyday lives, um, especially when that language is not somebody's first language. Um, as for me, at PC, I was a double major in Spanish and economics, and I had a really great experience as a Spanish major in the foreign language department. Um, I read a lot of books, learned a lot of language, and was able to improve my language to the point where I felt comfortable applying for a Fulbright and uh, felt comfortable living abroad and interacting with local people every single day. Um, and as for my future, Fulbright opened up a lot of doors. Uh, while I was abroad, I applied to graduate school, and next week I'm beginning my first year of a two-year Master of Public Policy program at Duke University. Um, and it was Fulbright that showed me that um, education policy is really what I'd like to end up in after 
um, my graduate school uh, program. And in addition to graduate school, um, it really helped me shape my, really shape my worldview. Um, this pin that I wear on my jacket was given to us by the American ambassador in Madrid. And it's a reminder not only of what I did in Spain, but also what I hope to do in the future, uh, breaking down barriers between people who see the world differently. So thank you for your time. Um, happy birthday, PC, and go Friars. A very eloquent young man, indeed. Of course, uh, study abroad is central to the success of most Fulbrighters as it fosters versatility, cultural competence, and empathy for the other, which I mentioned at the beginning of this brief presentation. And of course, it's uh, immersion in a, another culture is central, I think, to undergraduate study and particularly for Fulbrighters. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you so much to Professor John Margin. Um, now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Adrian Beaulieu, Director of the of Center for International Studies, who will answer some questions like why study abroad, who study abroad in the, distance, in the distant past, and who studied in the recent past, um, who can study abroad now, right? So thank you so much, Adrian Beaulieu, Director of Center for International Studies. Students like Taylor that I, uh, make me believe. It's students like Taylor that make me believe, or rather, I'm convinced that education abroad is really an integral component of the undergraduate program here at Providence College. Um, and that's been quite an evolution over the last 50 years. When you look back to 1962-63, when our first student, Ray LePage, went and studied abroad to Freeburg. There was not even a program back then. He had to come and ask Laurent Goussy, now a deceased professor of German, see if he could study abroad, and Professor Goussy helped make that possible for him. And then that began that, I will call, I guess, that golden era of Freeburg. Uh, Bill O'Neill here is one of those graduates from that program. So is Father Shanley, by the way. Um, and who, even to this day, talks about his experience of study abroad in Freeburg as the most transformative experience he had here as an undergraduate at Providence College. Well, as that era faded, study abroad also faded here at PC. So that when I arrived in 2007, study abroad was really becoming more a semester off for students, a semester away, rather something integral or academic part of their program. And study abroad had fallen to about 12, 13 percent participation here. So it was kind of not really very popular with students, faculty didn't really support it all that much, and students just were not going. So, and there were obstacles in the way as to why that was happening, two major obstacles. One of them was that students had to pay for their room on campus for the semester they were away. Now, can you imagine that, okay? So they were responsible financially to the college to pay for that room one way or another. So either they got a student to switch with them, or some families, incredibly, actually did pay. So they paid twice for room and board, here and where they were abroad, if you can imagine that. So that was clearly unfair, unjust, and that was the first thing we did away with to eliminate that obstacle. The second one was financial aid was not completely portable for students. So for many students on financial aid, study abroad was just really difficult or impossible for them to go on. So we began in 2011 a homeschool tuition policy whereby students would pay their tuition as if they were coming to the college, and in return, <clears throat> they would receive all their financial aid, so not just their federal aid and loans and so forth, but their institutional PC aid. So what that did was just to make every student on an equal footing, regardless of financial means or resources, study abroad was equally possible for every student from that point on at Providence College. So if you take a look at these stats here, there's some handouts, I hope you, hopefully you grab that on the way in or have that with you. So if you look at 2011 and 2012, you see that we had 229 students who went on education abroad that year, semester study abroad, which was an increase of 66 students from the year before 
before homeschool tuition came in place. So it was like two doors open right away, and students are able to go abroad now in numbers and quantity for the first time in the history of the Providence College. And each year, that number increased. When we got to the new core, the first class that was affected by the new core is in 2014-15. And you see that study abroad took a real dip that year. We lost, we went down by 30 students. And I suspect the reason for that is because students didn't really get the new core yet, didn't understand how it would work. Faculty advisors were equally, equally perplexed as to how to advise, to tell students what courses would count for. But once students figured that out, the numbers started going back up. And boy, did they go up again. So that last year, we reached a record number of students on study abroad of 380 students, 69 more students than the previous year, which was already a record year. And so this year, we had you know, 468 applications. We're probably going to cut through that 500 application thresh threshold in the coming year. So it's really been an outstanding experience. And now students really get it, incorporate it into their academic program, and it's now really part of the core curriculum here at PC, so that students are doing things that count in their major precisely as many of the students you've heard about here today. One brief mention for the PC in Rome program. That began in fall 11 as well. That's our program in Rome that incorporates a faculty resident director. Professor Margaret Manchester from history is there this year. She succeeds Professor Orly Hackstrom, who was there for the previous three years from the theology department. And again, you can see the growth that has taken place from 13 students to 72 this past year. Although our numbers are down a little bit this year, we've averaged over 50 students a year for the last four years. So again, terrific numbers there as well for PC. So, by now you're probably asking yourself, okay, what does all this have to do with language study? Okay, that's nice and good for education abroad, but how does this connect with what we've been talking about here this morning? So, next page of stats, if you take a look. So this breaks down the number of students who took a language course while on study abroad during the academic year 2015-16. And, you know, 141 students did so, nearly half nearly 50%, so that's pretty interesting that many students did take advantage of taking a course in language while on study abroad. Italian comes out of the highest, and that's because Italian is required in our Rome program, so most students there are taking elementary Italian, and also our elementary special ed students in Florence are also required to take Italian there as well. So we have a lot of students at the very elementary level of Italian on study abroad last year, but if we go over to Spanish, while the numbers are lower, we see now students taking courses more at the upper division level. Okay, so they're taking literature, content courses. So these are students now who have at least two years of college level proficiency, perhaps a little bit more. And so now we're seeing students really digging in to becoming much more proficient and fluent, maybe native fluency as, some, as Taylor here has gained in her time on education abroad. So, uh, so that's exciting, but we could do more in terms of encouraging students especially the advisors in terms of encouraging students to include, to think about incorporating language study while on study abroad in their semester. If you go to the back side of that page, <clears throat> and just to clear up that graph there, uh, students who took a language course, that's 45%. Students who did not take, 55%. All right, just to make sure you have that. It's hard to tell looking at that graph. So the next chart, look down the page, is take a look at the number of students now who are doing a core fo focus in language study. So the class of 2016, the class that just graduated, we see that 59 students did so, and mainly in Spanish. So that could have been incorporating, either doing the core focus completely here, by taking courses at PC, it could have been completely taking courses abroad, or somewhat of a hybrid, a course here and a course abroad, in many cases. So that's how they fulfilled their core focus. So, Many students in Spanish, some in Italian, and a few others in French. The classes of 17 and 18, class of 17, these are the students uh, who are, these are not you know, completely filled out yet in terms of these students still have the opportunity to complete their core focus in the language, and but already 45 students for 17 and 31 for the class of 2018. So most likely those totals, when done, when they graduate will surpass that number of 59. So this is one way to really encourage language study is by having students think about doing their core focus in a language uh, abroad. And certainly we hope also in Arabic and Chinese 
will offer opportunities for students to do that, to encourage students to, do, to go to China or to Arabic language speaking countries on that. The final graph there chart is to take a look at an experiment we did this past spring. We wanted more students to go into our Italy program, especially our Rome program, to be maybe perhaps more fluent or proficient in Italian. So, for the first time, the department offered an Italian 101 course in the spring semester, and 27 students enrolled for that. So, out of the 27, we were curious to see how many are going to continue on while on study abroad and take Italian. Well, the number is a little bit low, okay, only four students. Uh, two this fall, both in, in Rome, and then we have two next spring. One will be in Rome and one in the Florence program. So that may seem like not, not like a great start, but I'm encouraged at least that if we offer it again, maybe we can double that number four to eight next year, and that'll be a one way to try to grow this so that we have more students going to Italy who are better prepared, who have some Italian, and then who can easily complete their core focus by simply taking the required Italian course that they have to take there in the semester they attend the program. So um, I just want to end with by saying that education abroad is really part and parcel now of what we do at the college. Students come here expecting to do study abroad, and we hope that faculty and advisors will encourage students to how to make that fit into their four-year plan, whatever their discipline, whatever their major or minor, that they can include study abroad as one of their semesters here while completing their undergraduate education at PC. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for being here at 8.30 in the morning. I know there is a question. But I think we are running out of time, but please go ahead. If, yes, there is another panel, but if you want to. GPA requirement is 275, and chip students typically apply the first semester of their sophomore year. Thank you.
point, most health care took place in the home. So in our brief time today, Todd and I would like to discuss a bit about the rise of institutional health care in the United States, and also about the wider systems for providing health care in 1917. Please pipe in with any questions or comments along the way, and we'll be sure to save some time for questions and discussions at the end as well. We've also taken up the theme of the PC family um, in this uh, presentation and slideshow. So we have our own family members hidden in places in this um, slideshow, so see if you can spot them. So, first of all, how many of you were born in a hospital? Pretty much everyone. Was anyone not born in a hospital? Yeah, so everyone, everyone here, like 99% of American babies today, are born in the hospital, and most of the exceptions to that are born on the way to the hospital. Also in America today, 56% of people die in hospitals, and another 19% uh, of us die in nursing homes. So in 2016, hospitals have become a crucial location of care, a central institution where almost all Americans are born, <laughs> and where most of us will someday die. Today's hospital is a place where many of us work and visit friends and become parents and so on. And I just want to call your attention. We look at this picture and we see an adorable picture of Dr. Olszewski as a baby. We almost look past all the technology around him, right? So the isolate and the tubes and the blinking lights and the late, the early 21st century version of the picture, which is um, our second family member of the day. That's my son. Um, uh, we sort of look past that because we're so used to seeing babies born in hospital institutions with the use of medical technology. So it's no wonder that so many television shows and films take place within American hospitals today. They've become a setting for the most pervasive human dramas around. Birth, sickness, becoming a parent, um, death, money, and business all wrapped up in a single building. Today's institution is radically different from, that er from an earlier model. In 1917, hospitals had a relatively marginal status in the United States. Even those who worked to build and fund hospitals in the early 20th century would be shocked at how central the hospital would soon become. Care in hospitals was mostly reserved for those with no one else to care for them. Care was either free or extremely cheap in hospitals, and medical care in general rarely exceeded 5% of a fam family's annual income. In 1917, we're looking at a moment where we're beginning to see some interpenetration of hospitals with medicine, so doctors seeking um, to have residencies and to associate themselves with hospitals. But hospitals are very marginal and liminal institutions. Um, one of the things we'd like you to track as we move through today is kind of the architectural message of hospital institutions. So what kind of message do the hospitals that are being built at the turn of the 20th century tell us about the society in that moment? The closest, if you're, so if you were a, pres, a patient in the 1800s, um, before this moment of institution building, you have about four choices of where to go to for care. Most care would have been provided in the home or in the home of a community member. Community membership implied responsibility. Your employers might care for you. Your members of your congregation might care for you. Your neighborhood might care for you. Um, and if you found yourself in a place with no one to care for you, you might then find your way to an almshouse institution, a dispensary, or perhaps a hospital. These were institutions which were marginal, and they were locations for the care of, according to the charter of New York City's Almshouse Hospital, quote, the insane, the blind, the crippled, the destitute, and the abandoned. In 1810, for example, Ezra Stiles Eli, a Presbyterian minister, began to preach in New York City's Almshouse Hospital. And when he, asked, when he was asked about his odd role there by church-going New Yorkers, he did not betray much love for the people within its walls saying it was filled with the depraved and miserable of our race, a grand receptacle of blasted, withered, dying females. Does anyone know who those blasted, withered, dying females might have been? 
they were probably prostitutes, um, and therefore highly stigmatized in the society around them. Almshouses like these were care for people without any family or friends. The patients shared beds, they stayed in large open wards, and they were established with good intentions. And this is um, an example of Almshouse Hospital. This is the Suffolk County Poor House. This is the Boston Dispensary. They were established with good intentions, but people like Eli had to have a strong stomach and a high sense of purpose to enter this nest of what he termed moral and physical decay. The smells emanating from bodies stowed in as thick as they could lie, he said, was overpowering. He related that patients frequently had to share beds. On one pallet, for example, he found two, quote, abandoned girls, aged 13 and 15, both near death. When he returned, one of the girls had died, and yet her corpse was still in the bed with the ailing girl. So who would end up in these institutions? It's important to point out, and there's volumes of scholarship about this, we'd love to get deeper in, but it's important to point out that the idea that one would need to be cared for outside of family would be considered anathema. So almshouses and care were highly stigmatized. Patients were ashamed to find themselves in an almshouse because it meant they had been abandoned by their family, by their employers, even by their congregations. In this small society, community membership implied responsibility. In families, among members of the same congregation, between members of congregations, and between employers and employee. Employment conferred responsibility. In the 19th century, no responsible um, employer of a servant would allow even hired members of his or her family to be cared for by strangers. And cared for by strangers is a common theme that you see returning to over the course of the 19th and the early 20th century. How can we craft a society that perhaps needs to be cared for by strangers and, and grow comfortable with that is one of the things we start to see. In almshouses, though, the sick were often blamed for their own conditions. For example, Eli said, in nine cases out of 10, premature sickness comes in consequence of making a god of animal appetites. And this referred to um, what were termed then inebriates or drunks, what we might call alcoholics in a different um, caste today, um, who uh, cluttered the almshouse hospitals. And he and others in these institutions considered them living proof that God chastised sin immediately and inevitably through the body's own mechanisms. And for the most part, conditions weren't great in these hospitals. Um, people were um, quite crowded in, and they were, that condition was basically ignored or regarded to be a just punishment for whatever behavior was presumed to have landed them in an institution in the first place. This starts to change as the population starts to shift. So at the, at the start of the 19th century, um, for example, America's population, all told, was just a little over 5 million, and only about 300,000 people lived in communities long, larger than 2,500. People who were sick were able to be treated in their homes, and they didn't mostly need um, uh, care in institutions. Fantasies of drunken sinners aside, most hospital patients we know from records were urban workers or sailors. Um, only occasionally um, would a member of a prosperous or a respectable family end up in a hospital bed. Those that did were generally victims of accident, um, uh, were generally victims of accidents. But as the US population began to boom and increasingly moved to urban centers away from family networks, some philanthropists and reformers started to worry about a group of people they called the deserving poor, people who could not rely on family or community for care, and people who could not access care otherwise. And this led to syncing up sort of the history of these institutions with a longer and deeper um, history of charity care throughout Europe um, and elsewhere in the world. Um, and this led to the opening of our so-called voluntary hospitals, which is where most of our biggest institutions here in Rhode Island can trace their origins. These were institutions paid for by voluntary donations. The goal here is to be clean, ordered, and dignified places of caring for those that the trustees deem to be worthy of the care. Rhode Island Hospital, for example, was opened in 1848 after a donation by Moses Brown, and that's our earliest voluntary hospital here in Rhode Island. Many of the institutions were community-focused and centered around um, service and group membership, 
or employment. So St. Joseph's Hospital, for example, first opened its doors to the quote, poor and suffering sick of Rhode Island on April 6th, 1892, under the auspices of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Providence. Um, up behind me is the original building for St. Joe's, which we'll be talking a bit about the design of that building in a few minutes. Um, uh, uh, the building and the, the itself was purchased and the adaption plans were under uh, Bishop Matthew Harkins. Um, and the building was basically filled to capacity at the moment it opened. So it was looking to expand right away. Um, the Miriam Hospital, which is behind me here, was founded in 1902 um, by a group of philanthropists for, quote, the care of indigent Jews. Um, care would have been racially segregated as well by practice um, throughout the North over the course of the early 20th century um, uh, and by law, of course, in the South. Um, care for African Americans was often uncertain and spotty throughout Rhode Island in this period, um, depending on different institutions in different decades. Um, there was a black hospital movement, but I couldn't find much evidence here in Rhode Island. Um, and no uh, hospitals granted black doctors admitting privileges before the mid 20th century. So these early hospitals were private, voluntary, community oriented hospitals. Donations paid for the buildings, the employees, the food served, everything else. I love the design of these buildings because it seems to communicate this desire for order. We don't understand sickness. We're not sure what to do with our increasingly urban and increasingly um, diverse society. So we are gonna make some symmetrical buildings with some big windows and we are gonna impose some order on this confusion. And that's really what these, this is Pennsylvania Hospital behind me, which is one of the, the earliest and, and very important in the history of medicine, um, voluntary hospitals in the United States. Um, lay trustees are in charge of running the hospital, and it's the trustees who are in charge of admissions. So patients needed a letter to get admitted to the hospital, and the letter was not based upon medical grounds. It wasn't a question of, um, you know, being triaged in an ER um, if you show up with a, a cut finger or something like that. Um, it was rather um, about who was worthy and who was a member of a community. Um, so it would be a letter written by a clergy member, by an employer, saying that this person has come to need institutional care through no fault of their own and deserves admittance into the hospital. Um, so for example, Philadelphia's Lying In Charity Hospital assured its supporters um, in its fundraising materials that great care would be taken to, quote, discriminate between the deserving and the undeserving. Our object is not to encourage inactivity and improvidence, but rather to mitigate the unavoidable suffering incident by nature to the feebler portion of the human family. In this period, with physicians using hospitals to learn surgeries and beginning to kind of make inroads, the communities are still using hospitals to care for their destitute. So, Hospitals were not an acute institution. Um, they were rather used to cure long-term diseases. So very long hospital stays were common. Patients would work in the wards, cleaning floors, preparing food in the kitchen, all as part of a long time arrangement set up to support their care. The insides would have been very orderly and clean, not so much the outsides. So it would have been very common to have livestock, um, gardens uh, rolling around. You can imagine um, nurses, many of them trained, um, beginning to be more professionally trained by the 20th century, but in the 19th century sort of throwing scraps out the window for pigs and cows. But the inside um, was designed to be this kind of gleaming, clean location. Now, so people with certain diseases were forbidden from entering the hospital. Um, what might these have been? Any guess? Who aren't, what kind of diseases aren't we gonna let in? Okay, so things that were understood to be highly infectious, highly contagious. Um, uh, lepers, for example, had to have special um, hospitals, um, highly infectious diseases. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Yes, okay, absolutely. Another disease beginning to be understood over the course of the late 19th century as highly infectious, and certainly um, my, as long as we're keeping with our family theme, uh, my great-grandfather was shipped off to Denver to basically die of tuberculosis, but there was hope at the time. Jessica? 
Yes, venereal disease. Um, so if you had a disease that um, was understood at the time to be um, communicated through sexual contact, it would have just have been assumed that you should not have care in this hospital. Also, if you're injured, if you have a broken leg, if you have a broken arm, this is not the kind of thing that an institution um, is like these are set up for. These are about long-term rehabilitation of a group of people that they called inmates. What might have been the effect of this? Who wants this institution in their neighborhood? Nobody, yeah. So these are institutions that are better organized, more professional, lovingly cared for by dedicated men and women, often, um, uh, you know, but, and, um, still highly stigmatized institutions. And also the therapeutics in these institutions are secondary um, in the hospital to the patient's status in society, right? We admit people based on proof that they um, know. And the, and the patients, as I said, are called inmates. There were some arguments against hospitals as well. So behind me um, is the attack on Quarantine Hospital in Staten Island, New York. Here's an example of Bellevue Hospital, um, an engraving that was uh, published in Harper's Magazine of a woman overrun by rats. Um, these were, um, there were stories that people might get sicker in the hospital. Sicker morally from being around all these people that had been rejected by their families, perhaps. Um, and also sicker because of, a, of the concern about putrefaction and, and um, infection that disease spreads disease. So we have a long concern about iatrogenesis, which is a fancy word that means there you go. <laughs> um, absolutely. So the idea that hospital-borne diseases that you might get sicker or get newly sick, either biologically, morally, um, within the hospital, runs throughout. Um, still, hospitals grow anyway, and they grow dramatically. And some of this has to do with urban populations growing. So within 20, 30 years, you go from about 300,000 people living in communities bigger than 2,300 to 32 million Americans, many of whom are living in urban areas, so from five to 32. Um, workers are away from home. They need care. They don't have families nearby. We are starting to see the advent of some surgical technologies, some reasons why you might want to have surgery in a hospital and not in your kitchen or at a barber shop. Um, but for all this, hospital founders never envisioned the hospital as central to medical care. Even for the urban working classes, hospitals were seen as a last resort. They were seen to be expensive, unnatural, and demoralizing. So hospitals continue to grow. Over the span of the turn of the 20th century, you can see a sort of rapid increase in the number of hospitals. These would have all been nonprofit institutions, um, as we would consider them today, um, and these voluntary institutions funded by donations. Um, our own example um, of City Hospital in Providence, this is a picture I love. Um, note the cornfields and, and husks in the beginning. City Hospital was a public hospital built in Providence for the care of infectious and sick poor. And it was built on the outskirts of town at the time. So um, is that, I don't wanna give away the store, but the, fan, the building looks familiar. Am I right? Okay. Um, and here's where it was built. So if you take a look at this Providence City map, this is a 1904 Providence City map from before Providence City Hospital, or by the way, Providence College was built. The city limits are dead, are, um, indicated up here, so it says city limits on this line. And then if you look right where the yellow arrow is, those blank uh, squares not yet developed, um, that was the site that was chosen for Providence City Hospital. Um, but if you look right, it's not as high resolution as it looked on my computer, but Admiral is right up above that. So that's where we chose to build um, some of our institutions that are, are close by. So Debbie has given us uh, a very good overview in terms of how the hospital became an increasingly centralized center of care in the United States. 
even if, as we can see in this picture, well, the previous picture, if situated on the urban outskirts. So what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is to talk about the architectural layout of the hospitals themselves. How did the internal structure and the architectural design of buildings uh, dedicated to health care convey images of health and disease and the order and disorder that Debbie had alluded to previously. So these 19th century hospitals were built to convey the sense of order and social responsibility. And here, it's a little bit blurry, uh, apologize for that, uh, but cleanliness was essentially a sign of godliness. And the important take home point of this picture is to consider it in opposition to the earlier Bellevue slide of rats overrunning the ward. Rats overrunning, overrunning the ward, dirt, filth, sort of the, the disorder and the dis decay, decay found in uh, almshouses and early hospitals. Whereas here, we have clean floors, white uh, bed linens, we have cleanliness, we have order, we have a, a new sense of structure for the building. Nevertheless, outbreaks of hospital diseases, such as gangrene, and the poor gentleman behind me, if you can see, has uh, gangrene on his uh, right elbow. Outbreaks of hospital diseases, such as gangrene or blood poisoning, suggested to physicians that hospital design was somehow involved in the disease process. This gentleman went into the hospital and at some point in time, while in the hospital, acquired this gangrenous uh, sore on his arm. Reformers then assumed that if they could identify the architectural features that caused disease and then design buildings that eliminated those features, they could prevent the spread of disease. Three questions that I'd like to take up. What did the hospital actually look like? How were the hospitals constructed? And more importantly, how did hospital architecture and design reflect prevailing scientific wisdom about disease? Emphasis on bad air as the cause of disease gave rise to the practice of spatial isolation. Pavilion-style rooms, sort of long corridors, were intended to maximize ventilation and supervision and also to minimize patient density. Again, going back to this image here, how we have a long corridor, plenty of windows, essentially one window per bed. This method of eliminating the spread of the disease in the hospital began to change in the 1860s and 1870s when physicians began paying attention, not necessarily to the space between patients, but the interactions among patients and physicians. So a new idea of procedural isolation uh, began to take shape and really focused on activities that would contain or eliminate dangerous disease-causing substances. And what helped bring about this change? Does anyone have a guess as to what may have brought about this particular change in the 1860s, 1870s? Good answer, that, that's part of it, yes. In terms of uh, wartime hospitals and sort of being able to provide care Anesthesia, that's a good one. That is important in terms of uh, being able to perform increasingly serious and more invasive procedures on patients without really uh, causing great pain and discomfort to them. Think about, oh, <laughs> Debbie. Germ theory, yes. So germ theory, thinking about how disease is caused, thinking about how disease or disease-causing entities exist in us or around us. 
And the germ theory of disease, which essentially posited that microorganisms uh, were the cause of disease, placed the original source of germs in the air, floating all around us, not necessarily in the body, per se. And in the mid-1860s, Scottish surgeon Joseph Lister developed procedures to sterilize wounds and surgical uh, areas, antisepsis, which alongside uh, anesthesia really drove uh, an increase in more complex uh, and indeed longer surgeries uh, being carried out at hospitals, um, not only across this country, but across the world for that matter. As Lister explained, carbolic acid kept the germs that were floating in the atmosphere and clinging to hospital walls or other uh, furniture in the hospital from gaining access to the patient's body. And you can sort of see uh, in this image the two gentlemen um, who are on opposite sides of the bed have little misters. They're essentially sort of misting this carbolic acid over or around the patient in an effort to kill these microorganisms that may be living on or near the linens and the, uh, the, the surgical area um, that is being worked on, on that particular patient. So this new germ-oriented knowledge added a new aspect to hospital isolation. We can sort of see it to a certain degree with this little spritzer of carbolic acid. That being a combination of aerial and physical separation. And the most prominent example of hospital design uh, informed by germ theory would have been Baltimore's Johns Hopkins Hospital, designed by John Shaw Billings, who at that particular point in time uh, was perhaps America's most prominent hospital design expert. And Billings followed the pavilion model, many of the images that we've already seen of hospital buildings, um, which had been the standard hospital design of the, of the day. But he also emphasized that all floors and wards were to be physically isolated from one another. So this is a floor plan or a campus plan of the Johns Hopkins Hospital complex. And what is important here is to see the ways in which these pavilions uh, on the sort of far sides of the image are separated from each other by long and narrow corridors. Right? You're building uh, physical separation between patients. You're also presumably placing patients with specific diseases in specific pavilions. Right? You're sort of categorizing uh, patients by disease and then uh, assigning them to specific wards as a result. Billings also laid out the wards sort of one behind the other like a series of brick barracks. So this is another sketch plan of the pavilion of a ward. On the left, we have a sort of one story uh, floor plan. On the left, we have a two story floor plan. But again, the importance here is the long central corridor, organized beds along the side, you have at the top of each section sort of the assorted um, sort of prep rooms, the kitchen, the dining room, sort of staff offices uh, and rooms. So you see the physical separation between staff and patients. You also see to a certain degree the physical separation between patients, especially in context of this image where different uh, patients with suffering from different diseases are being housed in different, essentially in different buildings. Billings also designed stairways that open to the outdoors instead of directly into the wards. So this should be a familiar picture. We had it up earlier of St. Joe's. But you can see here the stairwell structure on the outside of the building. So physicians, if they were moving from one ward to another, would essentially have to go outside of the building, go up the external staircase, and then enter 
the ward above or below from the outside. There were also no elevators. It was primarily a stairway-based uh, architectural design, uh, in part because Billings believed that elevator shafts would give infectious airborne particles a new path of entry, right? If you have an interior corridor that is moving people from floor to floor, especially if floor A is housing individuals with one particular disease, floor B is housing individuals uh, suffering from a, a different disease, you have the concern of cross-infection or cross-contamination. So no elevators, stairways only, and often on the exterior of the building rather than interior stairwells. There were also quite elaborate ventilation systems, uh, and air in some of the rooms in a particular ward would pass over heating coils in the basement, uh, which would then cause air to rise through holes in the floor. In this case, air would uh, flow into one ward, and clean air would continue to move up on the exterior into the next floor, into the next ward, uh, often being then pulled up through a patient's individual uh, private chimney. So you have this very complex ventilation system in hopes of furthering the aerial separation between patients and between hospital floors themselves. And these design changes really signaled just one way in which this new concept of the germ theory of disease would and could impact the delivery of healthcare. So one hospital, and this, you have a handout in front of you, I hope everyone does. We have, I believe, extra copies in the back in case you don't have one. Um, but we wanted um, for you to be able to have this handout necessarily, uh, not necessarily to take a, a close look at now, but to be able to have a sense of how in 1916, uh, with the introduction of Providence City Hospital, how the hospital superintendent explained to public health officials um, how the hospital itself was designed. And you have a clearer sense of the theory behind uh, the design of the hospital and how administrators um, conceived its uh, structure in relation to efforts to control and prevent the transmission of disease within the hospital itself. In any case, Providence City Hospital was a seven building structure completed in 1910. And the hospital served as an infectious disease hospital. So themes that we've taken up so far of, of cleanliness, of aerial separation, of physical separation, all come into play in the design of Providence City Hospital. And uh, we pulled up one chart that's included in the image just to give you uh, a sense of the kinds of patients that were being treated at the hospital. So in a span, in a five or six year span between 1910 and 1916, uh, upwards of 6,800 patients um, had been cared for and discharged from Providence City Hospital. Uh, and many of these patients uh, had diphtheria, scarlet fever, uh, syphilis, uh, and very few had chicken pox and rubella. At the very least, you can kind of get a sense during the, uh, the, the years leading up to um, the, the construction of Harkins, and the, the founding of, of Providence College, what diseases tended to um, be affecting um, Providence area citizens. Providence City Hospital was renamed the Charles V. Chapin Hospital in 1931 to honor the retirement of Charles Chapin. Chapin himself, ah, yes, before I get to Chapin, this is a, a postcard that we found, which we think is pretty cool. It is a postcard of all things 
advertising uh, paint, interior wall paint. And you can see how we, you can see the Providence City Hospital. You see here in the inset photo, an interior photo of one of the ward floors, which for those of you who have offices in Howley or in several of the other neighboring buildings, this is a very familiar view. When we uh, make it to the second floor of, Hall of Howley and we look left and we look right, this is what we see. And this is the flip side of this same postcard. And I think what is important to be able to see out of this particular uh, postcard are the, the concluding sentences about stands repeated scrubbing without injury to the paint film. It reflects and diffuses the light rays into a soft radiance that often fills every nook and corner, right? So using clean, white, bright paint that is easily cleanable, easily disinfectable, very bright, very, uh, very much sort of in the vein of promoting cleanliness, especially if white bed linens are also being employed. You have a sense of, sort of a, a bright, clean, white space. And here is Shapin himself. Um, Shapin had served as Providence City Superintendent of Health for 48 years. He had a very long and fruitful career. Uh, and he was one of the nation's leading public health administrators and really one of the most vocal public promoters of the germ theory. Um, and I decided to screenshot of uh, an excerpt from one of his well-received booklets, How to Avoid Infection. Um, and this, I think, even even in 1917, even though the germ theory had really taken hold over the course of uh, 20 to 25 years, you still see by way of this excerpt how on a small car ride from New Haven to Providence, two small children sat in adjacent seats, one in front of the other. They were strangers, but soon became acquainted. During the journey, a ticket, an apple, a cookie, a cup, a book, a pencil, and candy were observed to pass from mouth mouth. If one children was a diphtheria carrier, the other probably caught the disease. So even 25, 30, 35 years after the introduction of germ theory, you still see public health officials and administrators working to describe the transmission of disease and the transmission of otherwise invisible microorganisms from one individual to another. In this particular case, from one seemingly innocent child to the other. So Providence City Hospital had been used to house destitute patients in the early 20th century to also house the highly contagious patients that we uh, saw listed on the, the brief chart. In the mid-1950s, Rhode Island had the worst polio epidemic in state history, and the wards of Chapin Hospital were thus converted into a large polio ward, serving nearly 500 Rhode Islanders with polio. Eventually, the hospital was converted into a psychiatric hospital, and eventually, after the hospital was closed, the campus came to be used by another institution in the mid-1970s, Providence College. So we have City Hospital being renamed now exists as Howley Hall, the home of the Health Policy and Management Program. So we wanted to um, spend our last few minutes up here together, so we'll just kind of take turns. Um, but I wanted to, uh, we wanted to have a bit of a discussion about what hospital design can tell us about our society now. So if all of this up to this point is about conveying order on disorder, about um, figuring out ways to uh, provide charity care to those who need it, and also about um, impeding infection. Um, and we can see that in the design and the buildings of the hospital around us. Um, as hospitals have continued to grow in influence, what do hospitals, what can hospitals tell us 
and hospital design tell us about the role of the hospital and healthcare institutions in our society today. So infection control, of course, is still very important, but it's no longer the fundamental piece of design. Instead, the design of modern hospitals in the US conveys some other stuff. Um, cutting edge modern technology, right? Um, even luxury, wealth, um, machines, right? Glass boxes, steel lines. Um, and here are a couple of modern hospital um, scenes. Also, also here are our final family photos. So, um, uh, half of the member, half of the uh, folks in these are our spouses. spouses. So, um, but yeah. uh, this is uh, so the the doctor here um, is um, a real doctor and, um, and is posing in a photograph designed particularly for this lecture. The um, patient here is a fake patient who's actually uh, was an architect in designing the, the Leahy Clinic, um, particularly their top floors, which were boutique medicine floors designed to attract high paying patients. Um, and then before they opened to patients, the architecture firm, um, so that's, um, my husband is in the chair and his boss is the nurse um, <laughs> um, taking pictures for the architecture firm. But I wanna just flag both of these because look at how the gleaming floors are still part of the image, especially in the image, I mean, it's impressive how gleaming they are in the image um, on my right, which was snapped this morning, because um, we, we thought we should have both our spouses. Um, <laughs> um, and But in the promotional image, um, on my left as well, right? We still have the big window, the ventilation, the echoes of the cleanliness, but that's paired with a big private room. Um, and the idea that you can uh, put out this iteration of what can happen in the hospital. So we don't call our hospital patients inmates anymore. Um, what do we call them? Okay, maybe we call them patients clients, consumers, and now even we're seeing trends to, to talk about them as guests. So we saw a, a shift towards a more um, commercial um, sort of shopping mall uh, mode of designing hospitals in the 70s or the 80s. So I have a ton of these images that we went through. We picked a couple to share with you today. Shopping mall or hospital? So we gave you the easy one for the start because we were afraid of crickets in the audience, but um, yeah, so this is a hospital. Um, what about this one? Yeah, it's the it's just an image of a of a shopping mall, but it's by the same it's by an architecture firm um, that designs a lot of our most prominent hospitals and shopping malls in the 1990s um, and the early 2000s. So the idea here is that hospital care is no longer about um, these symmetrical imposing of order on disorder, but um, it's, about some, it's about something else. And as we've shifted from understanding um, hospital patients um, in the ways of the, of the mode of the 19th and the early 20th century, sort of unfortunate people forced to be cared for by strangers, to thinking about them as consumers, that's reflected in the design as well. Um, and if you look um, just last, uh, just a couple weeks ago, um, the New York Times ran some stories about hospitals beginning to model themselves after hotels, calling their patients, including staffers, to call their patients guests um, in terms of talking about that. So um, we wanted to sort of leave you with these images and maybe some reflections about the ways in which um, the long tradition of charity care, particularly within the Catholic hospital system that um, Todd and I both teach about, we didn't get into as much today, as well as um, in our other institutions, perhaps the ones right down the, the hillside from us um, today, um, have, have shifted and changed and the architecture has, has reflected that as well. Um, so we have time for questions and discussion. <laughs> you take the first question, because I said we'd trade off.
also from home and back. There's the title of our, we're just, we'll, we'll find you afterwards, we'll write a little, we'll write something up. Because <laughs> that, that's such a good point. Right, and when you think about the language around, especially um, health reform measures and some of the reimbursement stuff you're talking about, we're starting to see a presumption that home care is what people prefer, home care is what people need, which is very different than what we were seeing um, in, the, in the middle section and even to the end of the 20th century in those same kinds of documents. Even if, you know, your grandmother herself or your whoever would have, you know, preferred to stay at home and didn't particularly like hospitals. But seeing that reflected in the regulations and the language is such a good point. And again, also kind of calling back, it also presumes that people have safe, clean, healthy homes to live in while they're being cared for, which not everyone, of course, does. Absolutely. <laughs> We'd have to call the security office to tell them that we're not going to. Um, Just an anecdote. Yeah. The, Whereas, as uh, uh, Dr. Carlson in philosophy, Lisha, Lisha says that we're the less brave doctors. <laughs> um, that second floor that you showed where we had the uh, We took some pictures. We were in That's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that it speaks to a wider, the reason I like sort of thinking about the space is it speaks to a wider question of how do we manage populations in transition? How do we manage sick people? How do we manage uh, college students, you know, young people? How do we, how do we, these institutions, how do we manage criminals? There, there's this, um, there's a, a common thread throughout this institution building that is both optimistic and caring and also judgmental and problematic and and it's all kind of uh, tied up I think nicely in that <laughs> we, yes. we, yeah it it wasn't 200 years old we we found we, we Todd and I felt like CSI tree was while we were <laughs> putting this together because while people were talking about the beloved oak, which was quite beloved, and we are not anti-tree, but um, and it may well have been very old and been here a long time, but not not that long because it's not there.
Right, which must have been miserable as a sociology professor in the 70s, but for a tubercular patient was perfect, right? right. Wheel you right out, big windows, lots of cold sure. air whooshing past you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs>we agree um and so in some part that's what we're hoping to take you now a little bit we're 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 pushing the deck just a tiny bit because there is a continued history of charity care in institutions um that are not falling prey as much to this goal to commodify all kinds of hospital um, procedures but when you look at kind of the cutting edge hospitals where people want to seek treatment where um you know people travel to that is exactly the trend that we're seeing is what you have identified so um yes Well, seeing no other questions, thank you for joining us this morning. Oh, and coffee and pastries are available in the great room.